happened to each other. And he says that the band name became like an adjective of or, or a verb about where everything was cool. You know, to say Van Halen meant everything was cool. And he said that the band was otherworldly. And he said he used to take his jean jacket and take liquid paper and make the VH logo on the back of his jean jacket as a kid, which is kind of cool. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, that's great. And he, he called the band a cultural force that was not just a rock band, but a cultural force. That Van Halen was not just a band, but a way of life. He also said, which I thought was interesting, and this made a lot of sense. And I never thought that like Sebastian Bach would make so much sense, but he, he did say this thing. He said, you know, when you, s- you see the end of masters like Eddie Van Halen or or Neil Peart, right? These two fucking legends. He says, y- you wonder if this is going to be sort of the end of that kind of musicianship in the sense that we live in a technology-driven age, but, you know, back then they pushed the instruments so far because that's all they had to work with. Whereas today we have a lot of easy outs. The technology has so many, you can do almost anything with technology, sort of like the movies. You can kind of just basically create anything. Whereas, you know, like, for example, like, I can give an example like Star Wars where George Lucas, you know, was dealing with, you know, like kind of practical realization props and he was trying to make magic out of that. What he's saying is you wonder if, you know, that breed of musicianship of of like a Neil Peart or Eddie Van Halen, if that's sort of the a dying art in a way, which is sort of interesting. That's an interesting really observation. Really is. You never thought that would be so thoughtful coming from Sebastian, but it, Sebastian as great of a rock frontman as he is, and I, I love Sebastian. I think he's great, but he's he's a real hardcore, dyed in the wool, like reading all the liner notes. Like he's a real rock and roll geek. He loves all this stuff. But I thought he brought that up, and that is a really interesting point, for sure. You know, I, I think it might be the end of the era in terms of the way those two guys approach their instruments Uh but i don't think it's the end of the line in terms of innovation it's just people taking what they have at the time and technology they have at the time and and pushing it even further yeah but yeah but in in terms of their approach and what they did yet we we may not see that again yeah right that's what he's saying right but as far as innovative musicians coming down the line i mean I i don't think we've seen the last of that yeah, I know, but what he, I think he's saying, I think we'll be musicians, but he's saying, like, will you ever have, like, someone like Eddie, who just spent hours and hours on the guitar, you know, like, living and sleeping with that thing. I mean, it was just like he was, that guitar was like part of his body. Like, you wonder if because of technology and all the different you know, ins and outs that you could do today. If someone would literally dedicate so much time and craft to an instrument like that, you know, I guess that's what he's talking about or how you could almost perfect anything in a studio today. You don't have that just sort of spirit. And, you know, also, I guess also the sense of recording. I mean, you listen to those Van Halen recordings and he's playing live off the floor and Ted and Don as brilliant as they were, knew how to capture it. You know what I mean? Like, they knew how to, like, record that sound. No one has recorded Eddie's sound the way Ted and Don had. They just had a perfect combination to really capture the sound of that band. That's why those first six albums sound so goddamn good. So the other thing is, I thought this was interesting. He mentioned also, like, it's like Eddie is like sort of part of our life. Like it's like hard to believe that he's gone. And to me, it's like, it's like, you know, saying like, you know, like the Eiffel Tower doesn't exist anymore or something. It's like something so monumental that it's like you, you figure it's just part of the world, part of culture. He also mentioned that Skid Row, and I didn't even know this, believe it or not, opened the first leg of the balance tour. Now, by the time we saw the balance tour, is that Dave, right? Wow. Yeah, now, okay. we didn't see Skid Row. We saw its collective soul, if you remember. Right. That was at NASA Coliseum. He also said that he went on a first class plane ride to Australia for 12 hours in first class, drinking coffee and sitting next to David Lee Roth, where everybody was telling the two of them to be quiet. And he said he was the quiet one in comparison to the two of them. <laughs> 
Wow. That must have been some plane ride, let me tell you. Yes. Yeah, so wow, then, those so then, two together? Absolutely. Oh and he said to Dave, what you need to do is do the history of the Eagles, like that documentary, for Van Halen. He actually told him that because Sebastian, like I said, is a hardcore fan. You know what I mean? He's a hardcore fan. So he said, that's what you need for Van Halen. And he also said, that there was a little talk of him joining Van Halen during the Gary Sharon time. He said that Ray Daniels, Van Halen's former manager, and Doc McGee, Skid Row's former manager, were talking at one point, but they didn't want Eddie to smoke weed. And and it was funny because Sebastian's like a real pothead. So he said, it was funny to me because I was smoking weed with Ray Daniels. <laughs> He says, but wait a second, the the manager of Van Halen can smoke weed, but I can't smoke weed? He goes, the lead singer of the band can't smoke weed? He goes, I learned how to smoke weed because of Van Halen, (laughs) which was kind of funny. That seems like a bizarre reason not to, uh, you wonder if that was a cop-out. You wonder if that's what they told Probably, probably. (laughs) Right? I mean, come on. I don't, you know, I just think that. I don't know if he would have fit in that. I mean, obviously, he could easily do all those songs for sure. But I don't know if his personality would have fit in there. But he said that he was summoned into Doc's office, but he never got to audition. But he didn't think Doc was too crazy about him leaving Skid Row anyway. And then he said, could 2020 suck any harder after losing Neil Peart and Eddie Van Halen? So that was another interesting interview. I don't know how far that would have gone with Sebastian. I think his name, you know, you toss out a name, you know what I mean? But that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, he's happening as in terms of a lead singer replacement. But Yeah, I think he's got too much history of uh, LSD, uh, lead singer's disease, oh, yeah, yeah. As, as Ed used to call it. And maybe his name was thrown around and Ed was like, you know what? I just don't need another guy like that. <laughs> That's right. You're probably. I right. mean, honestly, I'm not saying Baz isn't talented and all that, but he's, you know, he's very, he's a very headstrong guy, and that. That's not where Ed was in 96. He didn't need somebody like that. No, no. Eddie Trunk's been going ham on the whole Eddie Van Halen thing. So another guy that spoke out and on Ed was Neil Sean of Journey. So now, interesting enough, Neil Sean recorded a cover of Ain't Talking About Love with Linda Perry on vocals, and the background band was the band Vane, and he recorded it in 2008 for some compilation record that never came out. He ended up also on that record doing like a Sly and the Family Stone song with Sammy Hagar, but somehow it never was released, and then they played that on Eddie Trunk's show. And he was talking a little bit about Ed, so... Now, remember, Journey took Van Halen on their first tour back in the day. So it's funny that Van Halen would open for Journey because Journey is is a much lighter band. But back in the day, that happened. And he said that they became... Didn't they both open for Sabbath? I don't know if they both opened for Sabbath. No, you know what it was? It was was Journey... Then Sabbath. Well, yeah, but it was Journey and Ronnie Montrose and Van Halen. Right, but it wasn't. It was Sammy all- was not in Montrose when that happened. No, 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 it wasn't. It was just it was Ronnie right. Montrose solo at the time. Right. So here's an interesting little tidbit. So you know Neil became friends with Eddie, and they went driving one night, and I guess uh, it was Neil's car, or Eddie's car, or something like that. And he says, "What are you What are you working on now?" And he goes, "Oh, I'm working on this Hassas record, which is the uh, Hagar Sharon Arishan Sharif record." No, from- no, whoa, 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 no, not Sharon. Oh, what did I say, Sharon? No, 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 no. Sharon. No, Hagar, Hagar. Sean. Hagar, Sean, Aronson, Sharif record. So the song that Eddie liked and that he kept playing over and over again was the song Giza from that album. And oh, Eddie that's was, a great song. Yeah, it's a great song. Eddie was really interested in that song and he kept playing it over and over again. And he said, who's the singer, man? I really like this guy. <laughs> and obviously well, it was funny. Sammy, which is we're only a, a couple of years away from him joining Van Halen at that point. So the funny thing was, go, oh, you know this guy, Sammy Hagar from Montrose. So he said that back in the day, 
when Van Halen opened up for Journey, he said the original band had like a circus vibe to it. He said a real punk attitude with kind of a reckless abandonment. And they took them on their first tour for three months. And he says they would wreck hotel rooms pretending they were the who. And he says Eddie was heavily at that time inspired by the Live at Leeds album, which is the Who's Live at Leeds album. and he Oh, says, yeah, that's a great album. Yeah, and he also said that he knew that Eddie was going to be massive. And he did say that they jammed in San Francisco one night at Uncle Charlie's place with Eric Martin. And they also jammed with John Entwistle at the one of the NAMM shows. And it says the last time they were in touch was sort of at, in the 90s at the Steve Lukather's house. Ed would call him at 3 or 4 in the morning and mumble a few words and then jam on the phone for 20 minutes and then go, what do you think? And he'd just be like, oh, it sounds great, Ed. It sounds great, Ed. I'm going back to bed. <laughs> <laughs> so lots of fun stuff from Neil, who, who talked about his friend Ed. What would you, you make of that, Dave? That was cool. I know, you know, those guys have had somewhat of a history together. So nice tribute by Neil. Now, another interview came out from Irving Azoff. Who is Irving Azoff? He's Van Halen's manager. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. All right. So now I want to clarify a couple of things here that, you know, people kind of ran with a little bit. So Irving Azoff was interviewed by Polestar, and he called Eddie an unqualified genius. He said Eddie and Al were an inseparable duo. He said Ed had a big heart. He said he did a lot of things for people that nobody even knows about. That He was very kind and generous. He said that EVH gear has become a major force in the industry and will remain in operation. And he said Wolfgang and Matt Bruck, who is Eddie's right-hand man at 5150 Studio, will run it. And that's going to continue. So there's sort of interesting news there. He also noted that Ed was a great father. And he said that he's never seen anybody fight the fight that Eddie fought over the last 10 years. So obviously Eddie was going through a lot more than we knew, kept it very quiet. But he was talking about the 2019 stadium tour that almost happened. He said it very nearly happened in 2019 featuring founding members David Lee Roth, Michael Anthony. But unfortunately, due to Eddie's health complications, the tour was not to be. He said, we had a lot of stops and starts. There was every intention of doing a summer stadium tour in 2019 as the cancer moved around. Eddie uh, was physically unable to do it. So they were talking about, I guess, pairing up with Foo Fighters and Metallica. And he says, there's no doubt in my mind it would have been massive. And he also noted that Wolf and Alex, this is a quote from Irving, and I want to talk about this a little bit. Wolf and Alex will go up to 5150, the studio in Ed's house. There's been a lot of recording over the years. I can't predict that for sure there will be anything new, but for sure they're going to look at it. Now, you have to realize something. When he says that, that's sort of a general statement. Everybody's like, oh, they're already digging for, you know, stuff to release. What he said is a general statement. Like, yeah, they're going to take a look. Like, But you have to realize, like, there's so much stuff there that it's almost hard to really categorize, unless it's properly categorized. But you got to remember, they're also, it's all tape. I mean, <laughs> none of that stuff is digitized. So I don't know what's going to happen there. Everybody keeps thinking, you know, Eddie Trunk keeps going on and on. Oh, we're going to have Van Halen albums for years. I don't necessarily think that's the truth. What do you think? You know, I don't know. I mean, they got to go through all that stuff. That's tough to do. I I mean, for if Wolf and Al are doing that, I mean, there's a lot of emotional attachment to that. Yeah, but I mean, it's I mean, what I think that, they should do is what you've been suggesting right. for years is hiring an archivist right. to do it. So yeah. is there stuff there and will there be something coming out eventually? I, I think there will. I think there will. But it won't be for a while. Yeah. I think there's some catch up to do there because it's not like it's all cataloged yeah. already and ready to go and they go okay we just you know got to go to tape 15 yeah track no. 20 yeah. section b and right. we're good good yeah. to go but i think we will see stuff i think, I think we now what we will see I, I i i don't know will it be a live show yeah i know will it be studio songs will, like who the heck knows i know but i think we will see something not right away but i think we will ed was never a big fan of releasing 
older stuff. No. But I think Wolf and Al and, and whomever will go that route. Well, here's the other thing, though. Don't you think Wolf is going to be way more preoccupied with releasing his album once he's ready? Like, I would guess my guess, okay, in terms of Wolf, okay? I'm guessing sometimes. 